has submerged itself in the most devastating type of war possible, a trade war. Perhaps all wars are actually trade wars, but this one is a global trade war. World War I and World War II seem to have been awkward adolescent arguments when compared to the possibility of a third eruption ahead of us in this last quarter of the 20th century. This big trade war is being fought over natural resources, such as fuel and food supplies. All the war-ridden sections of the globe contain some major natural resource. As the world's supply of natural resources begins to deplete, the war will wage all the more furiously. Our resources are diminishing with awesome rapidity. Energy supplies, as we now know, do not beginning to realize the hard way that the waters of life are essential for life itself. Industrial wastes, oil spills, and nuclear blasts have so damaged the global environment that the food supply may run out. Fish in the ocean, in rivers, and in lakes are becoming contaminated. And we're still fit for consumption. They are being so overmarketed that world supplies are dwindling fast. The Soviet fishing fleets have more ships than the rest of the world combined. Wild animals are also being overkilled and are decreasing at an extinction rate. The weather itself, upon which the farmer and our crops depend, is not devoid of danger. Nuclear evolution is threatening the rhythms of nature. Drastic seasonal and temperature changes have been and are continuing to be induced. This unrestrained free-for-all rush for expansion, development and power at any cost, like the fabled lemmings, is leading us to our death. And as resources, food and fuel diminish, global competition is going to increase. Between 1975 and 1982, prices will continue to rise. Inflation will continue its upward spiral. Cities, states and countries will declare bankruptcy and submit to intervention or controls imposed by larger, more secure and powerful nations. Or else, the quickly deteriorate into anarchy. The stock market will of course, crash, but this time a global crash, unequaled in recorded history. The entire world banking system will be shattered. Many corporations and large individually owned industries will collapse. Even many of the multinational corporations will not escape. The economic system of the world will be drastically altered and the balance of world power will shift considerably. Free enterprise will be dealt a devastating blow. Democracy, as we know it, will never be the same again. We will be entering an era of social revolution. Controls and more controls will be imposed on citizens of every nation as each scrambles for economic survival. By 1982, there will be world shortages of just about all resources. The insecurity and chaos of 1982 will generate unbearable tensions and tragedies. There will be a life and death struggle for food and fuel between all nations. From 1982 to 1984 inclusive, there will be such stressful intensity that the fate of life on Earth hangs in the balance. Such a tremendous period of change has not occurred and will not reoccur in over 500 years. Not since the Renaissance. Not since the first book was printed in English. Not since the discovery of America and the subsequent destruction of the Red Indian civilization. These were all grand new horizons, 
and perhaps mankind in 1984 will also open brand new horizons in the space age. It is even conceivable that a moon or planet will be found within our solar system that could support human life and open a new era of expansion or colonization if we can afford it. Most likely between 1982 and 1984, competitive nations will plunge themselves and the rest of humanity along with them into a full-scale nuclear war. A third world war. A global holocaust. The survivors of which, if any, will be the seeds of the Aquarian Age. Sunspots and solar flares are the sun's way of reacting to the magnetic and gravitational balances of the solar system. Any intense angular alignment of planets will cause magnetic storms on the sun. The radiation from the sun supports all life on Earth and elsewhere in the solar system. However, the direct radiation from a solar explosion is deadly. surrounding Earth's crust. All three protective spheres react to solar radiations. This is visible in the form of weather changes and in the aurora borealis, or northern lights. Whenever the sun's radiation is disturbed, there is a corresponding disruption in our atmospheres. Man has a magnetic field or aura around him. It's commonly considered his vitality. Earth also has a magnetic field or aura around it, which determines the weather. The magnetic field of man is totally within and conditioned by the magnetic field and weather on Earth. Earth's magnetic field is conditioned by the total magnetic pattern of all the planetary magnetic fields in the solar system. Any change in the magnetic field of the solar system precipitates a corresponding change in Earth and the weather, and therefore crops, which in turn precipitate changes in man. The deterioration of our atmosphere will weaken Earth's protective shield. It is quite possible that the deteriorization of these spheres parallels the increase in cancer. One of our seemingly most indispensable technological advances, the spray can, has suddenly become one of our greatest enemies. Despite technological advances, the spray can spray spray can has suddenly become one of our great great greatest enemies. A certain gas is used in most spray cans that rises and begins to deteriorate the ozone layer of the ionosphere. The effect is accumulative, like arsenic in a body. If the ozone layer becomes seriously weakened, the human race and life on Earth will be in grave danger. A major solar magnetic storm could kill. <laughs> In 1982 and 1984, when the planets grouped themselves on one side of the sun within a 90-degree section 
a tremendous gravitational and magnetic imbalance will be created in the solar system. This will generate corresponding magnetic storms on the sun of a greater intensity than has occurred in over 500 years. The last time this occurred, however, the Earth's atmosphere, magnetosphere, and ionosphere were intact, unpolluted, and healthy. There is as great a possibility of life on Earth being destroyed by sunspots and solar flares as by nuclear war. And there is a great possibility of nuclear war. Genetic weaknesses evolve from living in overcrowded, polluted and unhealthy urban environments. Large cities over which the ionosphere and atmosphere has deteriorated are exceptionally vulnerable. It would not be hard to imagine a plague or epidemic that could kill a city. Kill a, kill, 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 kill a city. Even today in the 1970s, every year, a new fatal cold virus arises and spreads rapidly around the world. Every time you use a spray can, you are increasing Earth's vulnerability, as well as the risk of you or your children changing cancer. Discovered because its gravitational influence caused perturbations or fluctuations in the orbit of Uranus. Pluto was discovered because of perturbations caused in the orbit of Neptune. Each planet in the solar system has a potent gravitational influence on every other planet. These gravitational forces and their fluctuations, including those of the moons, are the sources of most seismic activity on any planet. The combination of certain intensities cause major earthquakes. Whenever several planets align themselves, increased seismic activity is the result. Earthquake-sensitive areas then react accordingly. Delicately balanced areas in the Earth's crust are then shaken. The Earth is a very sensitive organism of the solar system. Its balance can easily be upset. Underground nuclear explosions will yet prove to be as lethal and dangerous as surface explosions with perhaps greater consequences. A similar situation would be that of a junkie fatally addicted to heroin. Heroin. To heroin. Heroin. Shooting devastating explosions. Shooting. Shooting devastating ex explosions into his life system. The body can only take so much before total collapse. From 1982 to 1984, the planet Earth will be shaken in a manner that it has not been shaken for over 500 years. Nuclear blasts have altered the subterranean balance within the Earth's crust. The San Andreas fault line will most definitely react to this time and California will be devastated by earthquakes. Not only California, but the entire Pacific coast of North America, Central America, and South America will tremble and rock. And rock. Bull. Tremble. Tremble and rock. Rock. 
together, an awakening view of the world opens before our eyes. What does 1984 mean to NASA? How can planets have any effect on Earth and life on Earth? In 1984, all the planets in the solar system grouped together in a very small area on the same side of the sun. This is a very rare occurrence. In very simple terms, this means, in the eyes of NASA planners, that one rocket ship can go very closely to Mars, and then using Mars gravitational field, swing by and reach out to Jupiter. Using Jupiter's gravitational field, the spaceship can continue to Saturn, and then on to Uranus, followed by Neptune and Pluto. In other words, one rocket ship can do the job of six separate launchings at normal times. It doesn't take long to realize the economical advantage of such a project, and such a project it is. NASA definitely intends to take advantage of the system. It would be a fool not to. The multiple space venture is already scheduled and has been for years. The actual project has been toned down in size to only one, two, or three of such multiple planetary swing-by launchings. It takes many years to prepare a space shop. First, technological plans are drawn to train and educated, and the construction of the space vehicle needs to be organized and completed. When it comes to space projects, timing is essential. It boggles the mind to imagine the complexity of the planning. Once the operation is set in motion, there is no stopping. Too much is at stake. Deadlines must be met. All stages must be efficiently coordinated. All steps must go ahead as planned at the appropriate times. There can be no question of delays or work stoppages. The possibility of a worker's strike is impossible. All systems must be operating with a military-like efficiency. The blast-off must come by 1980 if the ship is to reach Neptune or Pluto. The spaceship must be ready by 1979. Construction must commence well before 1975. This military efficiency must be set up and maintained as much as five or ten years before the final blast-off. We begin to wonder how, why, and even if such a superhuman feat is possible. How could anyone or any business ensure such stability in a world of constant change? And no matter how it is viewed, NASA is big business. 
perhaps the biggest, with the most amount of subsidiaries and affiliated industries. It is hard to imagine how much fuel and energy is needed on a regular and dependable basis over a 10-year period to complete even one NASA project. How could such a vast supply of energy be supplied? Certainly a contract at a set price is desirable. How could energy be reliably regulated and guaranteed? And where would the money come from? We come back to the need for military efficiency, without which would be economic chaos or global inflation. There is a strong need for absolute control over the energy business. The government requires a monopoly. If you want to know where the energy and the economy is going, look to the skies. In order to meet rising demands of energy by NASA and the space projects, it became necessary to control the energy industries. Several years of violently fluctuating prices, followed by the energy crisis of 1974 and 1975, effectively wiped out the little guy and independent businesses. Necessary steps of control required for completion of Project 1984. By October 1982, the need will arise for global environmental and economic controls if mankind is to survive. How will such controls be imposed and who will enforce them? This is crucial. The major world powers like Russia, China, the United States and Europe will have to form a global governing body, perhaps a world federation of nations but one with power this time. Unless a world monetary system is introduced, unless international finance is controlled, unless nuclear arms are controlled, and the natural environment of Earth protected, how can we survive? We're coming to a point in space and a moment in time when we, humanity, will decide on all or nothing. Life on Earth will have to change if we are to live here, if our children are to grow up healthy, if their dreams of a space age are going to be realized. Partial change will not be enough. It will have to be a complete change. Either way, by nuclear warfare or without it, Global controls will have to be imposed and a world governing body will be created to enforce them. Crises precipitate change. Let us pray that mankind will mature sufficiently to solve this oncoming crisis diplomatically before a nuclear war precipitates. Nuclear war is the easy way out. We have municipal, state, and federal governments. We need a global government to oversee and control federal governments. In other words, we need a big brother. Big brother, where are you? Are you afraid of a big brother and its implications? Can you see any other way? I, for one, would prefer a big brother to no life, nor children at all. I don't think we can reverse gear now. It's too late for that. We will need technology to heal the industrial wounds to the Earth. Our children dream of space travel like we dreamed about fire engines and locomotives. Are you prepared to take away their dreams? 
the dawning of the age of Aquarius will cover approximately 430 years until the year 2377 AD, when the age of Aquarius actually begins. Contrary to popular belief, it has not yet begun, except in seed. The Aquarian age will be an age of sexual equality. As long as the balance between man's rights and woman's rights is not established, rest assured, the Aquarian age has not come. The Aquarian age is truly the age of humanity, its heights and its depths. It is an age of equality, of sisterhood and brotherhood, of space explorations and social revolution. Idealized as the Aquarian Age is, it will not be any bed of roses. For the mere existence of a space age on Earth yields the consequence of militant or strongly regulated lives. The Aquarian Age is more likely to be an individual briar patch with all its sharp thorns.